Hello, welcome to the Thursday, October 4th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Honolulu, Hawaii. We got a pretty neat guest post today from Nick Curter. Now, he came across a phishing site that wasn't very well protected and allowed access to logs and a number of additional details about the site, including a zip archive that contained the code behind the site. This is always nice from a research point of view because it gives you a little bit of insight in sort of how the back end of all of this works. In this case, it even led to the email address of the person receiving all of the data from this phishing site. Also gives you a handle on how many people actually fall for these phishing attacks. One other sort of interesting facet about this particular attack, the attacker here used a long list of IP addresses from which it would not accept any connections. Now, these include a lot of cloud providers and the like. The reason why you find cloud providers in blacklists like this is, well, normal users, they don't connect from cloud providers. They connect from home systems, maybe from business systems, but not from networks that typically only housing servers. On the other hand, a lot of researchers, of course, they use cloud systems either to run little virtual machines that make it easier and safer to access malicious sites or just to run automated scripts to, for example, probe for phishing sites like this. And if you come across anything interesting like this, of course, let us know. And yes, we do accept guest posts. They have to be current, have to be technically interesting. And of course, please no marketing. Now, sticking with phishing for our next story, apparently Microsoft Azure Blob Storage is being used to host phishing sites. The trick here is not just that you now have a site with a good IP reputation and such that's probably not going to get blocked easily, but as an added benefit, you also get a Microsoft TLS certificate. This blob storage is usually a subdomain under blob.core.windows.net. And of course, uh, with that domain, you do get a valid windows.net certificate that is issued by Microsoft. This trick appears to be mostly used to harvest Office 365 accounts, according to Netscope, the company that sort of discovered this scheme. Now, this, of course, is in particular attractive given the Microsoft certificate you get with this page, and it may even put some of the more paranoid users at ease if they see that this appears to be a valid page, just not one controlled by Microsoft. Similar tricks, of course, have been played, for example, with Google Forms. Google Forms has added a special note to every single form being displayed via the service, not to enter passwords, and has also put some controls around any password fields being used in Google Forms. And one company that got into trouble recently for hosting a lot of phishing pages was Soho.com. The company typically offers sort of software as a service, various tools that are helpful for small businesses like accounting and web-based mail and the like. But apparently they're having problems keeping up with some of the abuse reports that led to their domain actually being briefly suspended. But apparently phishing isn't their only problem. Cofence, a company that analyzes malware, has found that 40% of all keyloggers that they're looking at are using Soho.com email addresses to exfiltrate data. Now, while Soho apparently does have 30 million users, it's still sort of you know, one of the smaller players when it comes to email providers and the like. So certainly surprising that that large percentage of malicious software is using Soho for exfiltration. In part, this may be due to the somewhat weak abuse response that Soho has provided in the past, which allows for a fairly large dwell time for these types of attacks and then also led to Soho's domain suspension. 
And Surf to Home is writing about a vulnerability in older Dell iDirect cards. Now, these cards are usually used for remote administering systems. The vulnerability here is actually, I don't think, really all that serious. The problem here is that these older cards don't use a trust route, which means there is no sort of ultimately trusted certificate that has to be used to sign any firmware. In order to exploit this vulnerability, you need to however have physical access to the system so not really all that easy and the attacker already has to have quite a bit of access to the system in order to take advantage of this problem the latest generation of DRAC cards is not affected in that it does have this trust route in the system and only valid signed firmware can be used to replace existing firmware well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.